Welcome to Madison United Methodist Church. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Good to see you all this morning. Do have uh, just a few announcements we want to make, and uh, so we can keep you updated. Uh, if you have any information to go in the October newsletter, that needs to be in the office by tomorrow. So Patty needs those. Uh, you can either send the info by email, that's mumcsecretary1894 at yahoo.com, or you can call the office, 304-369-1262 and uh, pass the info in that way. But anything for the newsletter needs to be in by tomorrow. Uh, if you have a prayer request for the phone tree, contact Valerie Vickers or myself. Our cell phone numbers are, are in the bulletin there or the church office, again, 369-1262. And we can also add you to the phone tree uh, so that you can be contacted by phone or email or text if you would like any or all of those. In fact, we had two or three names this week that got added, so if you, that's, that's not a difficult process. Just pass us your information, and we'll be sure to add you on there. Where's the book club is meeting? They're meeting, uh, again, well, this says they're meeting again September the 3rd. Um, but keep your eyes open for announcements about that. Faith, family, and food uh, has been going really well. I've been enjoying that. Um, I've never been in a church that, like, specifically had a dinner once a week. No, I'm not mad about it, so, uh, <laughs> no, it's been great, and uh, this week, uh, the menu, pork roast with apples, roasted potatoes, salad, french bread, and birthday cake, so, this is going to be a good one, too, they've all been good so far. Uh, next Sunday, of course, is Communion Sunday, uh, next Sunday is World Communion Sunday, also, which comes up once a year, and so, uh, there may be a couple of different things around Communion next week, but I think it'll be interesting and meaningful, so. Uh, be sure to, to be here if you can. Also, men's meeting and men's breakfast next week at 8 o'clock. And be sure to bring non-perishable food items for the food pantry. Uh, we do have, do watch your newsletter. I will say there's some other stuff coming up. This will be in the newsletter, but since it's in the bulletin, I want to go ahead and share it. Um, you're invited to an afternoon tea at 2 p.m. on Monday, October 18th. Uh, it's called Tea with a Twist. This is something Janet Farmer is putting together. And uh, there will also be time for self-examination, answering some questions that John Wesley used to propound to the people that came to his, his uh, what they call classes, class meetings. And uh, then they're going to establish some small groups and things. It's going to be really, it's really interesting. The full announcement's on the back of the bulletin. But I think this will be a really, really good time. So if you're interested in that, and this is a way to connect with others and grow deeper, and uh, so it's called Tea with a Twist. So check that out. It's in the bulletin. Uh, also, don't forget Sunday, October 8th, following the morning worship, we're going to have our church picnic. Now, that'll be in the fellowship hall, because um, it got real tough to try to secure a shelter. We were working on that for a little while. So please bring a covered dish or a dessert to share, and the Alleluia Choir is going to be singing during the service that morning. So, coming up soon. And I think, Heather, did you have one? And then I've got one, and then we can, I think we'll move ahead. <laughs> Well, apparently Janet and I were just on the same, same wavelength when it came to stuff to start during that week. Um, I've had a lot of people interested in taking the basic lay sermon class. Um, it is a little far for some people to drive or they can't make it. So we are going to offer the basic lay sermon class here starting October 17th at 6 p.m. That will go for um, five Tuesdays. Uh, the only Tuesday we'll skip will be Halloween, of course, because they're doing trick-or-treat here that night. Uh, but I will have more information in the newsletter, so be watching for that. If you're interested, let me know so I can get you the information to order your book, because you will need to have a book for that class. Do you want me to make your announcement, or do you want to make it? I'll make that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so again, if you have any questions, just let me know on that one. So lots of stuff starting up in the fall, and I've got one more to add. Um, I know a number of folks have been asking about if we would do a Bible study, and we've been trying to wait till the time got right and where we could figure out what we're going to do, and so we're going to start Bible study uh, the Monday after Charge Conference, which will be, see, Charge Conference is the 10th, that's a Tuesday, my brain math is terrible, but I'm, I'm uh, let's see, this is 12, 13, 15, this is the 16th? Is it? Oh, it's Monday the 16th. It's all posted over in front of me, y'all. Huh. Uh, 
This is going to be interesting. No, um, Monday the 16th, we're going to start a Bible study. That'll be at 6 p.m. We'll do it here. Um, I haven't decided exactly where we're here yet. I think that'll partially be dictated by how many people come out. But I will say this for when I have taught before, and we'll do the first few weeks like this and see what happens. But I tend to do a very discussion based kind of Bible study. So we'll take a passage, we'll pull it apart. That I have a firm, there are no dumb questions policy. So ask whatever is on your mind, bring up whatever comes out as you see it. And we'll talk about it, we'll go through some notes that I'll make and make some things I want to make sure to teach. But it's very discussion based, it's very casual, and when I've done this before, I feel like we've all, including myself, learned a lot together. So please come out for that. It'll be Monday nights, uh, starting the 16th of October, so the Monday after Charge Conference at 6 o'clock. And uh, I'll pick a room and stuff before we actually meet, so I can tell you where uh, in a couple of Sundays. But what on I had two, what, what's what? Make it a scout. I'll, I'll leave clues at the door. You can figure out where we are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't be, don't be intimidated by discussion. It is very casual and a lot of fun, usually. So, And it's, you know, no dumb questions and really nothing's off limits. If you have questions about something that you think is edgy or controversial or you just don't understand, that's the place to come and ask, and we all kind of hash it all out. It's, it's been really good when we've done it, when I've done it before. I've taught that way in Elfie for 40 years, and so I want to give it a shot and see how you all feel about it. And if we get partway through and decide we'd rather do it a different way, that's what we'll do. So it's very moldable based on what we want and need. So. But the 16th, be sure to come out for that. Does anyone have any other announcements now that we've run through a long list of them? Yeah. Oh, did I skip that? Is it in the bullet? Before the T, it's on the back. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I went right over that. Uh, we do uh, need the addresses of our college students, those who are away. So the nurture team would like to have those, be able to Send them, some, send them some things and keep in touch. So if you have not turned those in, uh, we need those addresses for that. So be sure to bring them out of the office or drop them to Valerie or me or whoever. We'll make sure they get to where they need to go. Robin's got it. Uh, Stage this year is producing Wizard of Oz yet again. This is like our fourth time. Um, auditions are not not tomorrow, but next Monday and Tuesday, second floor of Scott High School. This is for second grade through seniors. Um, and it's a, sh a shortened version, but it's still the same story. And uh, we'd love to see all the people who are eligible to come out and audition. And if you want to help with this, we always need help, especially when we have lots of munchkins. Um, so the, the auditions are next week, but the show is not until April. So we're going to really take our time and not kill all of us in rehearsal schedule. So, thank you. Always good to not kill people during rehearsals. <laughs> I, I lived in Kansas once upon a time when I was a teenager. And when I moved, I, have, I cannot explain to you the number of people who said things like, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So the <laughs> Wizard of Oz is... Uh, Lives close. <laughs> no, be sure, to, be sure to help out with that if you can. And if you are eligible or you have eligible kids, theater is an awesome thing to get involved in. So you should. It's wonderful. Oh, and Kevin needs help with construction crews, so we know who's building sets and stuff. So if, you need, if you'd like to help with that, if that's a skill you have, talk to Kevin. Talk to John Holstein. <laughs> Any other amendments or corrections? <laughs> if not, the announcements stand as read. Um, <laughs> are there any other announcements this morning? All right, well, I once again neglected to ask someone to do the opening prayer, so unless somebody jumps up and volunteers in the next one second, I'll just do it. Yeah, don't everybody jump up at once. Let's pray. 
Lord, as we come this morning, we are thankful to be together in your house. Lord, we're thankful for being able to, to share exciting events and things coming up and to share some laughter and joy together as well. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of your family and to be gathered in your house. Bless us this morning as we continue with our worship. Uh, be with us as I preach. Lord, anoint that message entirely so it's yours and my hands are totally off. Lord, be glorified in this place. Meet us here as we sing and as we pray and as we learn. And we ask it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you would stand and join us in our opening hymn. It's number 371 in your hymnal, and it'll be on the screen as well. I stand amazed in the presence. <laughs> testimony this morning? Something you'd like to share, something you see God doing? So something that we have, my family has prayed for for a long time is happening this afternoon. Um, my sister-in-law, Louise Smith, for those of you who know her, is being baptized. Amen. Um, she has two sisters. One of them has, has been a Christian for many years, and Louise and her sister, Lena, are both being baptized today. So we could not be more excited, and yeah. praise God for answered prayers. Amen. You can applaud that. That's fine. <laughs> I heard two people go, and I'm like, come on. No, you can applaud what God's doing. That's okay. That's exciting. That's wonderful. Someone else. A 
Everybody's like, please don't let him look at me. He's gonna <laughs> I'm not going to randomly call on people. I'm just Yeah. And it's been years since I've heard that song, like it should be sung with all the parts, and it was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you guys sound great, by the way. I, I love when we get to those songs that are exciting and joyful, and, and I can tell that you guys are singing it that way. Like that's, When we don't do that in worship, we lose so much. And so I love that. I appreciate that. It's, Janet's waving here, and we've got Robin, too. So. So as you know, Scott played Chapmanville Friday, and it went the way we figured it'd go. <laughs> and it's okay. Hey, it didn't break 50 points, so it's okay. But the bands played together at pregame. And I just think it's great, because I know a lot of kids in the Scott band, and yeah, they have like triple the amount that Chapmanville has, but it's okay. But it is so wonderful to see them come together, play beside of each other, become friends, and that's the way it should be. Jerry and I were talking about it, and he, he echoed that. And uh, it's just great when the bands can get together and kids can de get together. So, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Janet's got you there. Yeah. <laughs> and I can do that. I can do that. I can tap hard. Praise God. <laughs> I am on a cane this morning. Yeah. Amen. Because God honored a promise that I made that I would not take my walker to the beach when I went for Chris and Chuck's renewal of their vows. And I want to thank God for honoring that promise. And um, now you may have to help me walk on the beach, but I will be there and I will not have on a bikini and there will be no dancing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have film. <laughs> um, and so I just want to thank God for helping me to honor that promise. Amen. It's an amazing thing to watch God work in the face of what people think shouldn't work. Because he just, he just takes all of that and says, but well, watch what I'm going to do. That's an awesome thing. Anyone else? Can I just say thank God that we can thank God out loud? Yeah. <laughs> thank God that we can thank God out loud. That is a privilege. I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's something that God gives us. But it's a privilege in our part of the world that we don't like have to worry that, you know, some legal authority is going to burst in and shut us down because we're a church. And there are places in the world, y'all, where, where churches can't be visible. Like they hide. We have brothers and sisters in Christ every day that are hiding out and worshiping together in secret because they can't do it in public. I mean, it's a blessing to be able to gather and to be able to share what God is doing. You'd be thankful for that. Anyone else? All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and move ahead in our worship. I'm going to ask Deanna to come and to share our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. You are my blessing this morning. Can I just say that out of all the bad things of COVID, it is nice if you can't be here to worship, to be able to worship by joining your church family online. And for those of you that are doing so, please consider if you can coming back into the building for worship because it's a blessing every time we're here. So with that being said, 
I'm going to be going out of town, and the next two Sundays I will not be here. But I'm grateful. The reason I mentioned it is I'm I'm grateful for the online service that I can feel like still a part of it and and listen to the message. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 6, and also continuing to 37 through 45. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face even more, remember his marvelous works which he has done his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Continuing on to verses 37 through 45. He also bought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. He spread a cloud for a covering, and fire to give light in the night. The people asked, and he brought quail, and satisfied them with bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It ran in the dry places like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness, he gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statues and keep his laws. Praise the Lord. This is the word of God to the people of God. Praise be to God. Amen. And now I'm going to ask Eva to come and have our children's moments this morning. Good morning. Unfortunately, Courtney couldn't make it today, so I told her that I'd fill in. So, I, of course, I'm going to talk about what was yesterday. Does anybody know what yesterday was? Jane? It was the first day of fall. And what happens in fall? Hmm? The leaves change, yes, that's the most noticeable thing. What else happens? It starts to get colder, yeah. So, um, the leaves start changing. Do you guys know what makes the leaves change? What? They start to die, that's right, they start to die. Do you know why they start to die? Why? <laughs> Why are you embarrassed? <laughs> the cold wind, and you know, I'm not a science teacher, but um, it's something very similar to when there's less light and it tells the trees to start kind of saving some water. Um, I'm sure there's a more detailed explanation, but when the leaves stop getting that water, they start to change colors and that's really beautiful, isn't it? But then after they change colors, what happens? They turn brown and they fall off, you're right. And when I was thinking about that, I was kind of thinking about that um, when, that's kind of what happens to me when I pull away from church and I pull away from God. When I'm not getting that food and water from coming to church and studying my Bible and being with those that believe the same way, I kind of start to wither and get grumpy and turn brown and... <laughs> And so I wanted to remind you guys to come to church and to study. And even when it's hard, you know, 
we didn't come a lot in the summer because um, we were traveling and doing different things. And like Deanna said, we're thankful for the online service. But there's nothing like being in church. And that led me to a Bible verse. And I'm in Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And it's that meeting and that encouragement that helps nourish us and helps us to stay on the right path and do the right things. So just a little reminder to always stay close to God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together. May your word fill us, Lord, so that we can spill over to others. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Eva. I want to move ahead with our time of prayer. And, uh, of course, we have uh, several that we've been, uh, been praying for. Uh, Ira is uh, continuing in rehab. I understand he was actually moved uh, here to Boone for rehab in the last couple of days. So that's, that's good news. And uh, Mary Brown is still up at Hubbard House. Uh, in Charleston. We want to continue to remember her as well. Are there other prayer requests this morning that we'd like to share? Valerie, I see your hand. My brother-in-law, Alan Parker, has AFib, and yesterday his heart rate was 240 beats per minute. And then he found, when he got to the hospital, he got to thinking he hadn't taken his morning medicine, so... Feeling better. Be sure to remember him. Absolutely. Remember Burr Hatfield. He fell at the office uh, on Friday evening, and uh, he's up at uh, Boom Memorial or something. He's he has Parkinson's had it some time, but uh, he's uh, he said my legs just aren't working like they ought to. So. Tell me the name again, Tom. What was his name again? Uh, Harry Hatfield. Burr Hatfield. Everybody knows him by Burr. Hatfield. Okay. No, I got Hatfield. I just wanted to make sure I got the right thing. Thank you. Well, um, last week I asked prayers for my neighbor, Tim Bailey, and he is um, home and doing better, um, but just continue to remember him. Um, but the day that he came home from the hospital, his daughter had her baby the next day. So they're all doing well, but continued prayers for them. Sure. Yeah. I'll be sure to remember both those families. Uh, the family of Corella McKinney and uh, the family of Jennifer Holstein, who is a friend of Marilyn's daughter. Sheridan Hill passed away yesterday as well. Go ahead, Kev. Uh, Robin goes for an ablation surgery tomorrow. So we want to keep her in our prayers as well. Yeah, go for it. Sorry. You're fine. Take your paper if you want. Uh, I. Uh, Yesterday in Southridge, I ran into a past student of mine who, who's much older now, and uh, I just we just got to talking, and he was in a really bad situation. He had just gotten out of jail, like it was a really bad situation. But I, I did talk to him. I tried to be a positive influence for him, but he kind of broke down, told me a lot about he'd made a lot of bad choices. He was in a bad situation. He was kind of stranded, he didn't know what to do. And of course my means of helping him were very limited, but I tried my best to at least be a positive light for him, to at least tell him, you know, you're still young, there's still hope, there's still things you can do. But I, I asked that our church this morning pray for our youth and our young adults. There is a lot 
of evil and a lot of terrible things that draw these young adults and draw these children. And this student was not a bad student. He was a wonderful student in school. And when he just got on his own, he just got into some bad stuff. So I ask that we pray for our youth and our young adults this morning as they develop who they want to be and who they, as they grow this morning. Um, we will certainly do that. Yeah, come on down, Jerry. Go ahead. I'm going right for a second. All right. Going along with what Cameron said, uh, we have the quick response team at the health department, and sadly, she has to bring us bad news. Uh, Seems like more often than not, uh, one lady here in the county lives over next to Whitesville, lost three kids in the last seven months to drug overdoses. Uh, young boy at Chapmanville High, uh, wrecked on a four wheeler, and was killed last week. Had a lady in Hearts Creek just handling money. She got some money that had fentanyl on it, and she reacted to it so severely that her mother was called and they had to put her in her mother's car and start her to the hospital before the ambulance even arrived. And when the ambulance, when they found the ambulance, they pulled over and they had to start CPR on her immediately. But she did survive. But as Cameron said, there's some dangerous things out there, and our youth sometimes don't realize what a world we live in. And, and if we don't understand that, we're not doing our parts as, as sponsors, as parents, as mentors, because uh, what the devil wants for our, our family is death and destruction. And there's no other way to look at it other than that. And it's a terrible world we live in, so you can't take anything for granted. But the scary part was for us, you know, we have a WIC program uh, at the health department, which is women, Infants, infants and children. And they bring their kids in and sometimes they let them run around the, uh, the health department. But she said, we really need to wipe down everything a couple of times a day because somebody could come in with fentanyl. It could be on some of the seats or somewhere. One of those children could come in contact with that and it would most likely kill an infant. And it's just a shame that that's, that's the truth of what the world is today, that we have to watch out for things like that. So. Pray that God will, will intercede and, and help us to understand we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Roger Foster, you said. Gotcha. With some health concerns, we want to remember him. I think Cameron and Jerry are right on too. We want to remember our young folks. The world is, uh, I mean, it was getting tougher when I was a kid. I remember my parents saying, boy, this is not the same world we grew up in. Now I find myself looking at the world now and going, boy, this is not the same world I grew up in. It's, I want to remember that. Anyone else? Sure. We will do that. Anyone else? I just continue to remember Carly Ann, the lady that we mentioned last week that we met in Nashville. Um, it's one of those stories that they've already shared. You know, there's a lot going on with her, but she really needs... She needs to find a church home again, and she needs, you know, she needs to come back, but she's got a lot going on. And also, we received um, three unspoken prayer requests, and these are ones that I just wanted to mention. Two of them are health concerns, uh, very serious health concerns, and the other is a very serious, urgent family need, family and dynamic matter. So just remember those, but just the three prayer con or special unspoken prayer requests that I have. Anyone else? How about unspoken concerns? Yeah. We come with a lot, don't we? But we come with a God who welcomes us to bring that. And I'm very thankful for that. 
Let's, uh, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Lord, as we come this morning, we are thankful for this place. We're thankful for everyone here. We're thankful most that you are here. This is a place we can gather weekly, Lord, to, to recharge with each other, and Lord, to spend time together as your body in your presence. Lord, we also know that coming here does not mean that we don't have burdens the other six days of the week, or even the rest of Sunday. And Lord, after we're here together, we have a world we have to live in outside of these walls. And so, Lord, we come with a lot of concerns and a lot of requests this morning. And Lord, I would pray first that you would just bless each and every one of us with your presence, with your guidance in each and everything we do. So, Lord, that we would always be lights for your glory in this world around us that so often kind of beats people up. Lord, they need to be able to see a light. And they need it to be yours. So shine through us, Lord. Lord, we think this morning of the requests that were specifically lifted. Lord, we think of Ira. We're thankful that he's been able to come back to Boone for his, re, or his uh, physical therapy. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with him as he recovers and as he heals. Lord, we think of Mary in hospice, and we would ask for your presence to dwell with her powerfully. Lord, that you would give her relief from any discomfort and any pain. And Lord, that you would surround her with your healing presence today. Lord, for Alan Parker, who has been dealing with AFib, and Lord, we know his, his heart rate got up well over 200 when he arrived at the hospital. And Lord, we know that's scary and that's dangerous. And Lord, we also know that you're the great physician. So Lord, we commit him to you and, and ask that, that this AFib problem would be, would be brought under control. Lord, that you would work your healing power there on him. Lord, touch his heart and set that to right. Lord, for Burr Hatfield, who fell the other day and Lord, who also deals with Parkinson's. Lord, we know that's a lot happening there. We pray that you would help his recovery. And Lord, we also pray that you would touch that Parkinson's. Because Lord, even though that is beyond the reach of, of doctors and medicine in terms of any kind of permanent solution, Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha, the Bible says. You are the God who heals us. So Lord, we ask that you would touch him with your healing power today as well. Lord, for Ken Bailey and the family needs there that, that he's dealing with as well. Lord, we pray that you would bless that family, bring healing where it needs to be. Lord, we're thankful for being home from the hospital and for recoveries, but Lord, we also know of other needs there. So Lord, we commit those to you. Lord, for the families that are grieving, Lord, we know there have been losses in the area. We, we named this morning uh, Corella McKinney and also Jennifer Holstein, Sheridan Hill. And Lord, we're sure there are others. Lord, for these who are walking with grief, Lord, that is a heavy, heavy burden. And Lord, we pray that you would walk alongside them. Lord, that when they don't have the strength to stand, that they would find that you are holding them up. And that you would just throw your arms around them and walk with them through the coming days and weeks and months. And Lord, as they work through this process of grief, Lord, that you would be their constant companion and their constant comfort. Lord, for Robin, as she heads in for surgery this morning, Lord, or in the morning, we pray that, that that would go well and go smoothly, Lord, that there would not be any complications, Lord, that even right now you would begin working in the, the minds and the, the hands of the doctors, the surgeons involved, and Lord, that all would be done just absolutely perfectly, and Lord, that afterward that you would be glorified for how well things have gone. Lord, for the, the student that Cameron mentioned, the former student of his, Lord, we, we pray specifically for this one. Lord, we know that, that he has had a, a really tough way to go here lately. Lord, I don't know the ins and outs or all of the situation, and Lord, I don't need to. We know that you know every step we take and every decision we make and every turn we make. Lord, we pray that, that you would reach to this young man, and, and Lord, that, that something that Cameron said or did yesterday would be kind of the impetus of that, that he would have been a light in the darkness for him, Lord, shining for you. Lord, also that you would help to draw this, this young man to where he needs to go. Lord, guide his steps. Lord, help him to get his feet under him and to, to be able to move forward. And Lord, also for the, the youth of, of this entire area. Lord, really of the entire world. You're dealing with things that we never had to deal with when I was younger. And, and Lord, that our parents and grandparents of folks my age never had to deal with at all. Lord, we ask that, that you would... Help to guide and protect them. Lord, this is a world that can 
steal people, for lack of a better term, or that folks lose themselves in a world like this. Lord, help them to, to not lose themselves, and Lord, ultimately, help them to find themselves in you. Lord, bless them, protect them, give them wisdom, all of them. Lord, for Roger Foster, who was lifted by John for some health concerns, Lord, we pray that you would surround Roger with your healing power and your grace right now. Lord, whatever his need might be, we pray that whatever it is, you would put it to right and that you would move in your power and glory. Lord, for Bob's granddaughter, who is having trouble sleeping right now, Lord, we pray that you would help to alleviate that as well. Lord, that this child would be able to get good rest and they would be sleeping as they should be. Lord, for the unspokens that Heather mentioned, Lord, I know what those are, and, and there's a lot going on in those situations. Lord, we just commit them to you entirely and ask for your watch care and for your guidance. Lord, for Carly Ann, who we met in Nashville, Lord, it's, it's another one of those situations where things have just taken a lot of real hard turns. And Lord, we ask that you would bless her today as well. Lord, you'd surround her with your presence, remind her that she is loved by you, Lord, even when the rest of the world doesn't seem to be showing it too much. Lord, that you would guide her and strengthen her and direct her in all things. And Lord, we pray that you would bind us together, draw us close to you, as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If our ushers will move into place, we'll continue our worship now with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Lord, we pray now that you would bless the offering that has been given. Lord, we ask that you would bless those who have given. Bless those who could not give this morning as well. Lord, use this offering to build your kingdom and to help this church to continue to be a light into the community around us. Bless us and keep us today as well, Lord. We ask it in the name of Christ. In the prayer request this morning, we heard lots of things about kids and problems and kids and drugs and adults and drugs and all that stuff. But occasionally I see things that sort of provide for me a life change. Last night I was watching a football game, a very good football game, and it beat Alabama. And I was watching it on the Oh! 
Well, if you can't sing after that, something's wrong with you, so stand up. <laughs> Let's join in another song, one more before the sermon. This is uh, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <clears throat> Tennessee a couple of weeks ago, I did. But they sang that song, sort of. <laughs> you guys sing that, when you guys sing that song, you sing that song. I know I say that a lot, but you guys don't know how wonderful that is. I've, I've spent a lot of time in a lot of churches where pe people are great and the worship can be wonderful, but people don't get enthusiastic, and I think there's something wonderful about that. And so I just want you to know I appreciate it greatly. We're going to be in a couple of places today. We're going to cover, now don't let the, the Jonah reference scare you because there aren't that many verses left of chapter 3 before we read that part of chapter 4. But we're going to be in Jonah and we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. So we're going to be in a couple of spots. Now let me ask you this, how many of you have ever heard a fish story? Okay, one's a little outlandish. You know, my fish was this big and then maybe it grows the more you tell Maybe this is probably a more dangerous question. How many of you have ever told a fish story? Boy, some of you were awfully quick to raise your hands. I appreciate your honesty. I, I was afraid that would get me in trouble. <laughs> well, Jonah, I know, Jonah, so a fish story. But it's most definitely a story about a fish. There is a giant fish involved. But this is another one of those places where we know the story we know. But is that all of the story? Like if I asked most of you to tell the story of Jonah, you know God told him to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. So he gets on a boat, tries to go somewhere else. The storm comes up. 
I should have gone where God told me to, so throw me over. So they do. Some friends those are. And then he gets swallowed by the fish. Three days later, he's on shore. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. They repent. And for most of us, that's the end of the story we know. And what's interesting is there's more story after that. So we're going to look at a little of that. What happens after the fish that we need to learn from? What does any of this have to do with a landowner hiring some people in Matthew 20? And really, what does that have to do with us? So let's take a look, because there's some important stuff we can learn in here. So I'm going to Jonah chapter 3. I'm going to begin at verse 6 and read down through chapter 4, verse 11, which is the end of chapter 4 and the end of the book of Jonah, by the way. So when it ends in this real awkward pause, that's just how it ends. Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. This is right after Jonah goes to Nineveh and preaches. This is what you get. It says, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it, in the, under it in the shade until he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. And if you didn't know it, that's the end of the book of Jonah. Let's pray for a minute and we'll move on. Lord, as we come in this morning and we're examining this part of Jonah that we don't look at that much. Lord, it can be really easy to look at this and go, what is the lesson here? Lord, I pray that by the end of this, that you have shown us a lesson, not necessarily about Jonah or about the Ninevites, but about you. Lord, show us your grace and your mercy today. Lord, may this message be entirely yours. May you be glorified alone in it and in this place. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. So where we picked up starts with the king of Nineveh getting the word, which means he's heard what Jonah has showed up to say and responds to it. And he responds really well. And he responds exactly as a prophet would probably hope most of the time that the people would hear you would respond. Oh, this bad thing is coming. We have been terrible and evil and sinful, so we should repent, and so let's do that. And that's exactly what the king of Nineveh does here. And then commands everybody else to do it. So he's going to repent, and he's going to bring the whole nation along with him, or at least the whole city. Nineveh was sort of a city-state in an area called Assyria. The geography gets a little complicated. We're in the 700s B.C. here, but it goes way, way back. And so Nineveh is quite different than we find it now at the beginning of the book. 
Because at the beginning, they are evil, and he really doesn't want to go there. And I think sometimes we lose a little of the context as to maybe why Jonah didn't want to go there so badly. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, because that's important. There's a lot going on here. For starters, at this point, God's people are not living as one nation anymore. Did you know that that happened? At one point, the kingdom divided into two kingdoms. So there are places in the Old Testament, this is one of them, where when we're talking about the kingdom of Israel and we're talking about the kingdom of Judah, we're talking about two different kings and two different kingdoms. It's an important thing to know. Ten of the twelve tribes rebelled at one point and made up the northern kingdom. That was Israel. The southern kingdom only had two tribes in it. At first it was just Judah, and then the tribe of Benjamin came along. So two tribes in the southern kingdom of Judah. This happened, this all happened after Solomon died. And he's appointed his son Rehoboam to be crowned king. And another guy named Jeroboam got up the other ten tribes. And aren't those great names? Rehoboam and Jeroboam. This is not confusing at all. <laughs> Jeroboam rebels. He gets up the other the ten tribes in the north and they all rebel. They all declared Jeroboam to be their king. And that they were going to forsake the throne of David, which is what was in the south. They didn't... They didn't like Rehoboam. They didn't want to follow him. They, they had actually, this gets real political, and this is going to get relatable to modern politics a little. And no, but when I say this, I am not talking about parties. I'm not talking about presidential candidates. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about generalities, so do not hear me the wrong way here. But they had gone to the new king who was going to be Rehoboam and petitioned for less taxes. If you ever wondered if that's been a problem for thousands of years... That's been, a, that's been an issue people have had for thousands of years. He, they wanted to be taxed less on certain things. He said, no, Jeroboam gets mad, they rebel, and Jeroboam is now suddenly the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. They put their capital in Samaria. Sound familiar to anybody? Southern kingdom remains loyal to the house of David. And at first, you've got Judah, and then Benjamin comes, so that's Judah, and its capital was Jerusalem. So you've got Jerusalem, and you've got Samaria, and you may be starting to see thousands of years ahead of the Gospels why the Jews and Samaritans did not get along. It stems all the way back to this stuff. It was divided this way for nearly 200 years. Then there was the Assyrian invasion, and it did not reunite the kingdom. It obliterated the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and up through Samaria, the ten tribes did not survive the Assyrian invasion. This is 722 B.C. So it collapses, and it's conquered, and only Judah gets through. And I may not, I mean, the context clues are pretty strong, but do I need to tell you what the capital of Assyria was at one point? Does it help if I say it was Nineveh? So enter into all of this Jonah. Take a guess where Jonah's from. He's from the northern kingdom. So, I mean, God was still dealing with his people, divided into two different kingdoms. But Jonah knows that these people have either, and we're not clear on when it was written, so they have either already invaded or they're about to. And it might be 20 or 30 years down the road. There's actually pretty good speculation that they were going to invade, and then these folks repented, and then Nineveh gets a new king later, and they invade anyway. But the point is, is that there is tension between the northern kingdom and between Assyria, which means there's tension between Jonah and the city of Nineveh. He really doesn't want to go there. And not only does he not want to go there, he really hates those people. It's sort of weird when we start talking about a prophet and talking about how they really hated those people, isn't it? He did. This is a, a massive flaw that Jonah's got going on. But he's a prophet. God sends him, and he doesn't want to go. In fact, when he goes to Tarshish, he's going exactly the opposite direction. Because to get from where he was to get to Nineveh, he has to go about 500 miles to the northeast. Do you know what there are not really in between the northern kingdom and Nineveh? Seas. He should not have to get on a ship to go here. So when you see him on a boat, he's gone the total opposite direction. He has said, God wants me to go over there, so I'm going over here. That's what he did. I mean, it's as, it's as much of a 180 as you can imagine as to where he was supposed to be. And you know the story. He goes, he gets on the boat, the storm comes, 
the sailors, who brought the storm? Jonah says, hey, I did, and then you need to throw me off. And, and so then they did. I still say those guys are lousy friends. Swallowed by the fish. He lives in there for three days. Fish barfs him out on a beach somewhere. Comes to his senses for a minute, and he goes and he preaches. Nineveh repents, and for most of us, as we said, that's the story we know. But then we pick up after this. Jonah sees the repentance happen. He has preached. They have responded. As a guy who preaches, that would be awesome. I mean, if I walked into a city of 120,000 people who knew nothing about God, and I could stand there and give them good news about God, or well, his news, Jonah's news is not necessarily good news, but it gave them a chance. His news was you have to repent or, you know, so there was something bad coming, but God was going to relent of that if they repented. And so if you, if you preach and 120,000 people respond to your sermon, I mean, y'all, it takes about 119,999 less people to respond to a sermon to get me excited, okay? <laughs> if one person responds, I'm there. And so you figure, man, Jonah, I mean, this, is a, this is like an eighth of a million people that have heard what he says. He should be overjoyed about this. He's mad. Y'all, I mean, did, do you understand what it is he's saying here? He literally prayed to God that God would kill him because they responded to what he, what he preached. Do what? He's sulking in like the biggest, exactly. It is, it's that toddler thing. When the toddler doesn't get what they want, <clears throat> that's kind of what it is, only a lot more serious. Because he's looked right at God and says, I did what you told me. They did what I told them to do when they preached. And I would rather die than stay here with them now. He had never worked through that hatred that he had going on because of what they had done to him before. I'm not re-preaching last week's sermon, but it's an important thing to notice. Jonah's still got this grudge. He still has this hate. I mean, it's, this is beyond just being a little irritated. Like, he hates hates these people. I mean, I'm using the word hate here. He hates them. And he even says, I didn't want to go do this because I knew you were compassionate and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in love and I'm so mad about them that I didn't want them to hear. You realize that is what he's saying, right? We have, we have a tendency, people, humans, all of us, not this church and not you all specifically. Humans, have the, we have this tendency to like white glove sanitize these things that happen in the Bible and go, oh, he was just mad a little bit. No, he knew God's grace and goodness and mercy and love and hated those people so much that he didn't want to tell them about it. It's a major heart issue, y'all. I mean, how do you hate a group of people enough for that? Here's the thing, though. Because Nineveh had been terrible, okay? There's no disputing that. They had been evil. Jonah's not wrong in his description of them. They were terrible. They were evil. I mean, these are the people who would go into a city that they conquered and pillage it and do unspeakable things to the people who were in it. This is not a good city. I mean, so nobody would just want to go hang out in Nineveh. Certainly not Jonah. Not anybody. Yeah, Heather's laughing at me. Do you like the little dance? I didn't mean to do that. I'm, in fact, I'm not sure why I did. Um, this is how you know I'm getting comfortable. I'm standing behind their less, and you're getting my little goofy stuff. They were evil. They were terrible. And here's the thing. God still gave them a chance. You realize that? That as much as Jonah hated those people, God still loved those people. Nineveh gets a chance. And Jonah really gets a couple of chances. Because Jonah ran directly from what God told him to do. First of all, I don't recommend that course of action. God says do something, you should not go the other way. 
been there, lived it, done it. It's not a good idea. Every example in the Bible where God says to somebody, go do this, and they go do something else, doesn't work out the way it should, and they end up going back and doing the thing that God told them. Skip all this. Go do it in the first place. But Jonah gets a second chance. Because after he gets spit out from the fish, God commissions him again. If we go back and read that part, it's the same thing he says at the beginning. The fish spits him out, and he basically says to Jonah, I'm sending you to Nineveh. You go and tell them this, this, and this. And it's the same thing he told him to tell him at the beginning. He gets a second chance. Nineveh gets a shot. Why is that? Because the mercy of God is so big that in the midst of the evil and the mess and the disobedience and whatever else, God is still wanting and willing and able and, and chooses to be, if people will respond, to be merciful and to be loving and caring in the middle of that. By the end of the story, it seems that Jonah is really squandering that second chance real hard. He's staying mad. And as we read, that's where the book ends. How many of you did not realize that's how Jonah ended? It's okay if you didn't. Most people don't. And I heard a professor one time tell me, and I'm going to use a big word, but I'm going to explain it, um, that we could not just teach the Old Testament as a group of what he called didactic moralisms. That's a great way of saying you can't teach the Old Testament as a series of things where you go, okay, look at this story, now do this, don't do that. Okay? So you can't do that all the way with the Old Testament, but you can do it sometimes. And I'm here to tell but here's the, here's the thing, is you look at Jonah, and you look at certain parts of his story, and you go, okay, well, we should be like that part. Like the second time that God commissioned him, and then he went and told him, and he went and did what he was told. You should do that. You should not be like Jonah at the beginning of the story. You should not be like Jonah at the end of the story. So what do we do with Jonah? What do we do with the Ninevites? They're horrible people at the beginning of the story. What have they done by the end? Exactly what they were supposed to. God says, repent. They said, we've been evil. We repent. And then we brought the whole nation along. We all repent. God relents of the disaster. Why? Because he's merciful. Because they repented. So don't be like the Ninevites at the beginning, but be like the Ninevites at the end. Don't be like Jonah at the beginning, but be like him in the middle, but don't be like him in the end. What is the lesson here? I think the lesson is less about the people in the story, and it's more about what we learn about God in the story. The story includes Jonah and the Ninevites and some sailors who also repented, by the way. They were pagan at the beginning. The Bible says that. And then by the end, they throw Jonah off to the side, and then they offer sacrifices to the Lord. And it's that little capital letters, all of them, Lord. That's Yahweh. That's the only one you get that gets that. They offered sacrifices to the right one and made vows after that. So I mean, they like, were repented and converted after they threw Jonah off the boat. Lousy friends, but they got it right. So I mean, there, are, there are examples of great people and cool things that happen in the story. But why do those happen? They happen because God's moving. The story is not about Jonah. It's not about the Ninevites. Ultimately, it's about God. And it's about what we learn about him and his great mercy in the middle of all of this mess. Because if you just looked at that and tried to sort it out in a very human way, you don't get a lot of good conclusions. You end up with that weird, don't be like him, but be like him, but don't be like him explanation. But if you look at this and say, what does this tell us about God? And what you see is that every time somebody's in the wrong place, God is extending a hand of mercy if they will just grab a hold of it. And that doesn't matter if it's Jonah, who has lived a pretty upright life, or he wouldn't be a prophet. Or if it's the Ninevites, who have lived a pretty terrible life up to this point, and done horrible, terrible things to the nations and people around them. And God says, you know, there's a chance for you too. Which means even the Ninevites had not blown it hard enough that God's mercy wouldn't try to reach out to them. Reaching into places that mercy does that we don't expect it to go. So now fast forward a couple of thousand years, maybe a thousand years, and that reality hasn't really changed. Jesus is telling a parable in a little bit of a different way. This is in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Here's the thing is the parable sets up a little differently, but it, we land in a similar vein. So here it is, Matthew 20, it, should be on, it is on the screen, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. 
after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour. You have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did, I, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. It's interesting. The ones that were late to the work party, as it were, still got paid the same amount. The ones that were earlier got mad. Well, that's not fair. We've been here all day. They've only been here an hour. What gives? And the 11th hour, by the way, about 5 p.m. The end of the work day, about 6 p.m. And a denarius was about one whole day's worth of wages. So these guys who worked all day got paid a day's worth of wages. These guys who came one hour before the work day is over got paid a day's worth of wages. What gives? We've been here longer. I love God's resp- the master's response, which is God's response. Do you begrudge my generosity? And I'm right back at Jonah. Because you can see Jonah going, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in God's kingdom. I live among God's people. I have followed my whole life. I am a prophet. I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. And you're going to send me to these people who haven't lived a day right in the entire existence of their country over there. And I'm going to go over there and they're going to repent, aren't they? You're going to be generous. And I'm not going to like it. And I can almost, and God's asking him the question, well, do you do well to be angry? I mean, it's almost that same thing. Do you begrudge my generosity? I think it can be really easy for some of us to fall into the trap of going, man, I've been a Christian all my life. Maybe it's not fair that these other people come in the last year or two or five or last two or three or five minutes of their lives and they receive the same reward. Now that's not fair. Grace isn't fair. And was it fair that the Ninevites who have done all these evil things should be offered a chance to repent? Is it fair that the guy who works one hour gets paid the same as the guy who works eight or ten or twelve? Is it fair? The landowner did not tell them it was fair. He told them what he'd do. God didn't tell Jonah it was fair. He told him what what he would do if he would go. It's not about that. It's not about whether or not grace is fair. It's about what God promises to do. The ones that worked all day and the ones that worked an hour paid the same wage because that's what they agreed. Do you see the theme here? Grace is not about fairness. God's mercy is not about being able to deserve it. Because if it was, then Jonah would have been right, and those people should not have repented at all. But that's not what it's about. God's mercy is, is y'all, we can't measure it. We try to apply these little, these balance scales of, well, this is more or less fair, or this makes more or less sense. It's not about that. You can't measure the, the mercy of God. It is this, this unfathomable depth of grace that goes farther than you can ever imagine. These stories are not about whether things should be fair or not. And it's really hard to take a life example from any spot with Jonah, except one little place. But then you can't follow that out any farther. You really can't take great life examples from at least the, the, 
the vast majority of the Ninevites. You get a good moment there. But it's not about trying to take life examples. It's about learning who God is. And here's the thing, is that then we cannot come along and say, well, then so-and-so shouldn't be able to come because they haven't lived long enough in this life of Christ. And, and I think even the more dangerous one that I've probably heard more often is this one. It's something like, you know, I can't come to Jesus because I've done all this stuff. God's mercy surely can't reach out to where I'm at. I've blown it. I've blown it 50, 60, 80, 100, 1,000 times. Or even, you know, I once knew. That one happens a lot too. I grew up in church. I knew what was right. I still ended up in this place that I shouldn't have been in. And now I'm sure God's grace won't reach there because I knew better. God's grace can reach 120,000 crazy pillaging Ninevites. And you got nothing he can't reach. And here's the thing is even the Ninevites had nothing that his mercy couldn't reach. Because God's grace and mercy given these stories are absolutely unable to be measured and not only that they're not fair thanks be to God. Because that should give us massive hope. You cannot stack up your sins high enough that God's grace can't cover them. You can't be so messed up that mercy no longer counts or that grace suddenly becomes fair and you lose it when you're weighed in a balance. Grace isn't fair. Thanks be to God. Because here's the thing. Is it, it's, it's not about how many sins you've got. It's not about how messed up you are. It's not about any of that. It's about what the master said would happen. Because he said, if you work in the vineyard for all day or you work in here for an hour, you're getting the denarius. And that's what happened. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. Not you might, not you could be, not you're saved for now, but you might blow it and not be... You will be saved. And you know what this is about? It's about what the master said would happen. Because Jonah was exactly right in part of his complaint. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in steadfast love. Now Jonah stayed mad at the end of the story, which is not how we like to think about it. Unfortunately, leaves that book in a pretty uncomfortable place. So it doesn't really resolve. So, okay, here's your lesson from Jonah. Don't do that. But here's the thing is you're here today, so you don't have to do that. Because God gave Jonah another chance. And I'm sure, I mean, Jonah didn't die at the end of the story. So God probably gave him more chances. We don't know what happened to him. I'm not writing him off. I'm just saying where the story stops He's still upset, but Jonah didn't die at the end of that book. And we know who God is, so there were quite likely more chances after that. I mean, if he gave Jonah a second chance, and he gave Nineveh a chance, and he's given you a chance. And if there's something in you that you feel like just hasn't been covered by grace, then I have really good news for you. Grace isn't fair, so bring it here. Because you'll get more than you need. Do you realize that, too? You're not going to just get enough to kind of cover it up. You're going to get so much that it blots it out totally, never to be seen again. We're not just hiding it. We're washing it away, man. God is merciful. And what's beautiful is that, I know I've said it before, it's not fair, but it's true. So as I close, it's the nice secret cue for Cameron to come back up. If you're in need of that mercy, then this is the place. This is the time. If you're more along the lines of how we said you shouldn't be when we look at parts of Jonah, and man, you got a lot of anger pent up, or there's something in there that just says, boy, really, I, just, I don't even want to tell this certain group of people or this certain person about what God's mercy could do for them because I'm just so mad at it. You know, that has happened since Jonah, right? I mean, that's probably happened at some point in, in most of our lives where we're just, we don't want to share that with whoever because we're mad at them. Everybody sort of looks at the floor when I say that. I get it. We've been there. If you've got anger pent up like that, you don't have to end like Jonah's story ends. 
God's mercy is too big for that. He's got it for you too. It's here and it's available. So let's move past the first part of the fish story. And dive headlong into that ocean of grace, folks. You're not going to find a fish swallowing you down there, but you're going to find yourself surrounded in the mercy of God. All you got to do is jump in. Cameron, go ahead. If you would stand, we're going to sing our closing, our invitational hymn, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. And then if you need to come, come. I'll meet you down there. Thank you. as we close. I'm going to be out of the office Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'll be back Wednesday night. Um, I'll be at the United Methodist Foundation of West Virginia's Academy of Faith and Generosity for three days. Um, the office is still open. Patty will be here, but I will be out Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then I'll be here Thursday, and Patty will be gone. So, <laughs> um, But just if you, if you need something, I'm still reachable. This is not a vacation. My phone will be with me. I so. uh, just wanted to make everyone aware of that so if you have charge conference forms get me those by next sunday and if you can get them during the week this week all the better let's close with our benediction and now may the peace of god which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds and the knowledge of the love of god the father and of his son jesus christ our lord May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you now and always.